So why don't we go right over to you, Sarah, to learn more about the American artist, Edward Hopper. Good morning, everyone. Yes, Edward Hopper. Let me just pull this up really quickly. Edward Hopper was born in 1882 in Nyack, New York, which was a ship and yacht building town on the Hudson River, just north of New York City. He was one of two children of a comfortably well-off family. Uh, Hopper's parents encouraged his art and kept him supplied with materials, instructional magazines, and illustrated books. And Hopper first began signing and dating his drawings at the age of 10. He eventually graduated to more realistic depictions of everyday urban scenes that really shock the viewer into recognition of familiar surroundings. No one captured the isolation of the individual within the modern city like Edward Hopper. His imagery of figures within urban settings go well beyond their role as modern cityscapes. They expose the underbelly of the human experience within that city. So while his work officially falls within the movement of realism, it offers a more evocative look at what life was like between the world wars. He paints with minimal action, stripping away almost any sign of life or mo mobility, and he adds dramatic and striking lighting. Hopper suggests something of the inner life of his subjects, which lends itself more towards abstract expressionism. He in injected significance and the individual's existential state of being into his paintings. House by the Railroad is like other Hopper works about a lot more than its simple title indicates. This three-story Victorian house with its distinctive roof sits alone on an elevated plane cut off from the viewer by the horizontal denotation of a railroad track. Hopper further alienates the viewer by drawing the shades of the house, closing off all opportunity for contact between those who reside inside versus the march forward of modern life signified by the railroad tracks. See, the play between the worlds depicted and that of the viewer no doubt provoked the dialogue of the postmodern art period that again eventually led itself to abstract expressionism. The house itself resembles many found in the New England towns that Hopper frequented growing up. In 1930, this piece actually became uh, the first painting to be acquired by the newly established Museum of Modern Art for its permanent collection. Automat captures a woman who has stepped out of the busy urban scene, taking refuge in a local diner. This image perfectly captures Hopper's depictions of the isolation of the individual within the city. The main figure is depicted sitting alone at a table, staring pensively down at her coffee. And the fact that she still wears one glove, having removed the other, indicates that this will be a brief stop and that she'll soon hurry on to another destination. By definition, automats, self-service <laughs> restaurants where food and drinks were um, dispensed through vending machines, suggest isolated experiences. It's the opportunity to pick up a meal without exchanging pleasantries. And the subject probably had a great appeal to the introverted Hopper. Here again, uh, he highlights a specific snapshot of people's daily life. The scene in Chop Suey depicts two women at a table in a restaurant with another couple in the background. The features being shown in particular detail are the painted, the woman's face, the features of the couple in the background, the teapot on the table, and the restaurant sign outside. So these are all features that would bring a sensory element besides sight uh, to the painting. You've got the buzzing noise of the outside light, the voices of the people in the background, the texture of the coat, the taste of the tea, the smell of the cigarette smoke held by the man behind, and the muddled light from the masked window. So by focusing on this specific moment in time, Hopper creates a very visceral piece that really draws in the viewer. In Grounding Swell, Hopper depicts a cat boat occupied by four men and a woman facing a growing swell. Um, the artist made numerous studies of boats as a child growing up in Nyack, and his passion for seascapes and nautical subjects is noted throughout his work. But as with many of his pieces, this painting goes well beyond its role as a seascape. Despite what looks to be a clear day, you have the dark shape of the bell buoy uh, symbolizes impending doom, as does the boat's dramatic dip. Uh, this painting was produced in Hopper's Cape Cod studio between August and September of 1939, 
as war was breaking out in Europe. So there's some suggestion that it symbolically represents the loss of innocence in the face of an uncertain and an ominous future. Office at Night depicts a woman and a man alone in an office. Hopper elevates what might be a simple scene of everyday life um, with an extremely raised angle of perspective. Uh, the psychological tension between the figures depicted in the room is achieved through the compression of the space, which limits their ability to move about in the space. Uh, several years after the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis purchased this painting, Hopper wrote them the following explanation, quote, the picture was probably first suggested by many rides on the L train in New York after dark and glimpses of office interiors that were so fleeting as to leave fresh and vivid impressions on my mind. My aim was to try to give the sense of an isolated and lonely office interior, end quote. Uh, Hopper was a frequent train traveler and was always struck by the slices of life that were witnessed through the passing windows. Hopper's gas offers a perfect example of his ability to take a simple subject with seemingly no action and turn it into a psychologically charged one. Here he depicts a single figure alone at a, ga a lone gas station attendant uh, within an overall quiet and bleak setting. You've got a little bit of uh, enlightening with the presence of these bright red gas pumps. But the light in this painting, both natural and artificial, gives a sense of drama. Hopper's aim was, quote, the most exact transcription possible of my most intimate impressions of nature, end quote. In this case, the loneliness of an American country road. And fellow artist Charles Birchfield believed that these paintings would remain memorable beyond their time because of his honest presentation of the American scene. I love this piece. Um, Nighthawks is considered to be the embodiment of existential art. It captures the alienation and the loneliness, again, a theme we've been talking about, indicative of urban life, kind of similar to Automat as well. It depicts four figures in a sparsely furnished diner at night, and a single light source illuminates the interior and spills outward onto the street. This work, with its simplicity of setting and dramatic lighting, excellently illustrates his interest in themes of alienation, melancholy, and ambiguous relationships. None of the four figures in this picture interact with one another. And so as the viewer were left to fill in these details, is there music playing in the diner or is it silent and awkward? Who are these people and why are they at this diner so late when it seems like the rest of the city is asleep? So this piece really pulls us in and involves the viewer in the experience, just like so many of his other pieces. Uh, this work was produced late in Hopper's life when he was nearly 70 years old but it embodies the same themes of existentialism throughout his works. This is a painting of his wife, Jo, who is 68 years old here, sitting upright on a neatly made bed, staring out the window. The morning sun streams through the window, bathing over her and onto the blank wall behind. Her ex expression is ambiguous, perhaps pensive, perhaps regretful. Again, we don't know, we're left to fill in the blanks as the viewer. And as in much of his work, the figure is included to capture a mood or suggest a psychological effect rather than serve as a portrait. Uh, the painting depicts the meditation between the inner reality and the outside world. Edward Hopper and his wife rented a cottage in Truro, Massachusetts in the summer of 1930, and they would return there regularly through the 50s. Hopper began office in a small city while he was staying in Truro in the summer of 1953, and he finished it in his New York studio in that fall. And rather than depicting the Cape Cod landscape, um, office in a small city is a scene that could have taken place in any American town in the mid 20th century. His explanation of his earlier work, Office at Night, also applies to this painting. He expressed, quote, my aim was to try to give the sense of an isolated and lonely office interior rather high in the air. And this was the only oil painting that he completed that year. And finally, uh, Second Story Sunlight offers an excellent example of how Hopper animates the inanimate and injects it with significance. Two figures sit on the balcony of one of the houses one, a scantily clad young woman perched atop the railing, and the other, an elderly woman reading a book. 
Hopper's wife, Jo, was actually the model for both figures, as she was for nearly all of, um, all of his later paintings. As Hopper stated, quote, I don't think there's any idea of symbolism in the two figures. I was more interested in sunlight on the buildings and on the figures um, than in any symbolism, end quote. So growing up along the banks of the Hudson River, it has, it has its distinct qualities of life. Hopper became sensitized early in life to what he considered a certain elation about sunlight on the upper part of a house, a very specific thing to focus on. Um, but the delineation of the stark white building facades and the, one, the contrasting um, ones cast in shadow illustrate his efforts towards this goal. So that brings us to the end of our art talk. I hope you enjoyed Edward Hopper and I'll see you all next week. Thank you so much, Sarah. I really enjoyed all of those paintings. Um, maybe one day we can see a film about Edward, Ho Edward Hopper because I heard that there's a Grateful Dead movie coming out next year. <laughs> right, by Martin Scorsese. That's right. All right. So I'm not sure if Edward Hopper is going to have the same mass appeal as Jerry Garcia, but it certainly would be cool. What a contrast, right, from the 60s psychedelia movement with uh, the Grateful Dead and the idyllic 40s and 50s that Edward Hopper so, just so, so interestingly depicts. Uh, Office at the Night, I actually was fortunate enough to see that at the Walker Art Gallery. And if you, any of you who do not know what that art gallery, it is actually one of America's most famous art galleries. It's a small art museum in Minneapolis. If you're ever through Minnesota and Minneapolis, please take, take the time to, to go there. And, uh, you know, what's quite interesting is that, you know, his last painting was 1960. So he really had an opportunity to depict that really idyllic period in America in the 40s and 50s. And, you know, it kind of reminded me of, of Wayne Tebow's um, uh, art that we had seen earlier. And so quite, quite interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah.